let's um, let's put it in the uh, get it in the context of of evidence. So when we when we talk about evidence, when we're using evidence for decision making, um, the evidence uh, is it, it usually takes the form of uh, of measurements um, of evidence of the existence of something or the non-existence um, or of a causal relationship and probably the most common thing um, that we're interested in is most of the time is cause, causal relationships um, and often the, these other things can be actually construed as causal relations um, anyway so for example you know a measurement here about every average age of customers well you can sort of um, describe that in terms of perhaps not causation but um, association so um, the the idea being that someone being your customer you know causes or is associated with them being of a certain average age okay um, then there's uh, existence um, so uh, You have a series of customer complaints about um, uh, your, your company's piece of software that is evidence it may not be conclusive evidence but it might be evidence that there's some kind of a bug in the um, in the software you had an exam question about um, a you know possibly defective chainsaws and so the you know the customer can customers returning the chainsaws because they were damaged uh, the engine housing was cracked that is evidence of a defect not necessarily conclusive evidence of a defect it could have been there were just some customers who were clumsy and you know dropped their chainsaws onto concrete or something and cracked them but um, it could be it could be evidence now <clears throat> this whole Bayesian thinking idea which is extremely important and if you you know if you google it you'll find no end of stuff about it um, it's ultimately based on the idea that for any given hypothesis any claim about the real world um, we'll have some sort of prior belief about how probable it is that the hypothesis is true so we could have a, a hypothesis about the value of a measurement that you know the average age of the customers is 36 years old for example um, or it could be you know a probability um, of the possibility that you know the chainsaws are have a manufacturing defect which causes them to crack um, or it could be um, about a causal relationship okay a probability that structured questioning in job interviews causes selection of better performing employees so these are all hypotheses and the idea is you come with a you come with a prior hypothesis before you start looking at new evidence now um, and I've given you know some examples of the sort of statements there of prior hypotheses so 90% sure the average age is under 30 that's the sort of thing people say and they may they may or may not have good reason um, for believing it um, there's a 40 percent chance there's nothing wrong with the software the customers are just configuring the product incorrectly or for causation i've been recruiting for 20 years i doubt structured interviewing would make much of a difference i'd say there's a 20 percent probability that that's true <clears throat> there's a convention that if you really have no idea about something you just give it a prob prior probability of 50 percent or odds of 0.5 over 1 minus 0.5 right equals 1 okay so giving a prior hypothesis odds of 1 just means you don't know you don't know if it's true or not so the big um, thing in um, this Bayesian thinking this Bayesian updating so what we're updating is we're updating this prior hypothesis and we're updating it on the basis of new evidence that comes to us so <clears throat> we use this thing called the likelihood ratio to do this and the likelihood ratio is a little bit of a it's not counterintuitive but it seems a little odd at first when you first try to understand it so the likelihood ratio is the probability of the new evidence 
if the hypothesis is true, divided by the probability of the evidence if the hypothesis is false. Um, so let's let's take the first case here, um, measuring the age of customers. So let's let's say you do a some sort of a survey of a randomly selected sample of customers and you ask them their age. The um, and the the average that you get back from that sample is 32 years, okay, 32 years of age. So um, it's a sample, and you could actually probably calculate a confidence interval um, for it. Maybe the maybe the confidence interval is let's say the confidence interval is 28 years to 34 years. Um, so armed with that information, you you need what you'd need to think about is what's what's the probability of that evidence the evidence being the results of the sample of the, of the survey um, if my customers are under 30 if the average age of the customers in the actual population is under 30 what's the probability of that compared to the probability um, of getting that survey result um, if the average age of the customers is in fact over 30. in that particular example with those numbers it's probably not terribly conclusive um, but you might give it um, that evidence might cause you to um, say that it's a bit more probable um, that the hypothesis is false than it is that the hypothesis is true so your likelihood ratio is going to be a little bit less than one maybe be 0.9 or something like that so the way likelihood ratios work is if they're greater than one, then the evidence increases our belief in the hypothesis. And if it's less than one, um, it decreases our belief. And if it's equal to one, then it makes no difference. And we'll work through some examples um, to try and make this a bit clearer. Um, so let's, let's look at a, um, uh, an example here. Uh, so the hypothesis um, <laughs> this is turning out to be true. Um, <clears throat> the hypothesis is that house prices in Australia will f oh no sorry fall no no this has turned out not to be true. House prices in Australia will fall significantly over 2020, 2021 and 2022. So um, prior estimate of this probability we'll, we might we'll have to place ourselves back in time here. Let's say that we were thinking about this in 2019. Um, because oddly enough, in Australia, house prices have gone up since the pandemic started quite significantly in some places. So um, prior estimate of the probability, the prior probability, 70% probability that house prices will fall. Now, um, some new evidence comes along, okay, after this, after we've formed this belief, and the new evidence is Australia's largest bank reported in May 2020 the results of a scenario planning exercise. The best case was an 11% fall in the housing price index by 2022, and the worst case of 32% fall. If I remember rightly, I actually wrote this case last year, um, and I'm pretty sure this was taken from an actual scenario planning report from a large bank. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, um, Here's what we've got to ask ourselves. How likely, how probable is this evidence, this report, um, if our prior belief about the hypothesis that house prices are fall, going to fall is true? So in this case, we'll say, okay, we'll give that 65%. Okay. So remember this, this 65, this 70% here, this is our belief about what's going to happen to house prices. It's our belief they're going to fall. This is something completely different in a way. This is this is our belief um, that the bank would have come up with those results if this hypothesis were true. Okay, so this likelihood ratio is um, is about the evidence, not about the hypothesis. Okay, so it's in this case it's about 
how likely is it the bank that would have come up with these findings in its report if in fact it was true that house prices were going to fall and the second part of the likelihood ratio is um, how, how likely, how probable is it that the bank would have come up um, with these results if in fact house prices were going to stay the same or go up. So that's, that's the bit that's a bit hard to get your head around at first is that you actually, this, this likelihood ratio, LR we would call it, is actually going to be 65% divided by 40%. Okay. Now. <clears throat> that's 105%, not 100%. That's right. So they don't have to add up to 100. Okay. So it's... Um, this is what you, I know this is confusing <laughs> so you what you you're talking about the probability of two with the likelihood ratio here you're talking about the probability of, of two different things so one is um, one is um, if in the real world house prices are actually going to go up or are actually going to fall rather um, how probable is it that the bank would have come up with a report that says they're going to fall? And then the second one is, um, if in fact house prices are not going to fall, they're going to go up. What's the probability that the bank would come up with a report um, that says they're going to fall? So the one way to think about this is that, you know, you don't have a very strong belief in the, in the bank's forecasting ability. We will be looking at other examples. We'll be looking at some more in the tutorial tomorrow. I think it might start to become a bit clearer there, but they don't have to add up to one. Um, I think there are some specialized circumstances where they might have to, but they don't, they certainly don't generally. Um, have to add up to one. Now, <clears throat> um, normally, then what happens is when you're learning this is you get told, okay, plug the numbers into this thing, um, which we're not going to do. <clears throat> uh, because basically, what we can do is if we have, what we're actually going to do is we've got our prior probability of 70% there. We're going to convert that to odds, and then we're going to multiply the odds by the likelihood ratio, okay, okay, we multiply them by the odds of our prior probability, and that will give us the odds of the of our hypothesis after we've taken into account the new evidence, and then we can convert that back to a probability. So we'll work through this. Let's take it. Okay, so we, I'll use a little bit of terminology here because it's a little bit messy if we don't. So we'll just say P1. That's our prior probability that the hypothesis is true. So that's our prior belief, 70% probability that house prices are going to fall. And um, O1 is uh, the odds, uh, the odds of that. So... Um, so P1 equals 0.7, 70%, and O1 equals 0.7 over 0.3, right? Which is 2.3, okay? So our prior belief is um, the odds of house prices falling are 2.3, 2.3 to 1. And then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that 2.3 by the likelihood ratio here, which is 65 divided by 40. Okay. Um, what was it? 0.7. 
0.4 divide uh, 65 times 40. okay I think that should be correct me if I've done this incorrectly but I think um, if we multiply that by 65 over 40 we'll get uh, 2.84 say 2.8 does that sound right So O2 equals uh, let's say 2.8 and um, P2, so that's our posterior probability, is going to be equal to um, 2.8 over 1 plus. 2.8, right? It's our formula for converting odds back to probabilities, and that will give us roughly um, 74%. So just just work through those yourselves, and correct me if I'm wrong. I've done a bit of rounding there, so there'll be a little bit of rounding error in all of that. Actually, there's no rounding error. I got three point seven nine. Double checking what I did here. I got a you got sorry, you got for the odds. Um, let me just yeah, let me just do the calculations again. Uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.3, that's right. 65 times 40. Divided. Yes, <clears throat> you're quite right. I don't know how I got that. Okay. That's three. Oops, that's three point seven nine. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what our odds of belief um, in the hypothesis that house prices are going to fall. That's what they change to after we get the um, the bank's report, and then um, our posterior. Uh, sorry. Our P2, so that's so we call that O2. So P2, converting that back to a probability is 3.79 over 4.79. Okay, uh, is that right? Yeah. you get Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what so what's happened there is we started off with a prior belief. So we had a you know our our best estimate based on what we already knew was 70% chance that prices are going to fall. And then we get a a bank report and so we make some judgments about basically about how how good the bank is at forecasting. Okay, so we at least believe that they're more likely um, to have come to a conclusion about prices falling if that is in fact actually going to happen um, compared to if it wasn't going to happen. 
Um, so we give them some credit for their ability to make forecasts. And then, um, so that gives us this likelihood ratio. So it's, the likelihood ratio is the, that's this, um, uh, that's point, um, 0.65 over 40. So um, that's the sort of magic number for changing your belief. So that's 1.625. Okay, so the likelihood ratio is 1.625. So that's that's the magic number for changing your belief, if you like. But you've got to multiply it by odds, not probabilities. Okay, that's that's the kind of mathematical trick that makes this easier to do. So our um, so we have uh, prior odds of 2.3, which is equivalent to our 70% prior probability about the house prices falling. We multiply it by this uh, likelihood ratio, and then um, we get posterior odds. That's our adjusted degree of belief expressed as odds that house prices are going to fall. And then we can convert that back to probabilities, and that converts back to 79%. So that's the... Um, you, you'll notice in all of this that this is a... There's a fair bit of subjectivity in this exercise, okay? We're making judgments about probabilities of things. We're estimating things. So in the real world, um, a lot of the time that's what we do, okay? We make um, we make judgments or we get experts to make judgments for us or we get, you know, banks to write reports or consultants or whatever, but we get estimates in terms of probabilities about things. There are some cases where we have pretty exact information about probabilities. It's not always subjective, um, but often it is. And um, but once we've got those, this is the the kind of strict logic by which we should be using those estimates to make adjustments to our belief. There isn't another way to do it. This is. Um, this is fundamental scientific reasoning type logic, but it's not something we're trained to do. I mean, we're not, we don't grow up learning to do things with likelihood ratios and, and odds and whatever. And the relationship between, um, you know, the probabilities of evidence and prior and posterior beliefs and so on is not a linear relationship. It's not a straight line relationship. And we're not used to thinking in those terms either. So, um, you know, most people just operating intuitively don't do this kind of reasoning very well. You can often do it better if you actually are fairly explicit about the reasoning process. All right, so I've spelt out all the calculations here. I've rounded that to 80% there, but um, okay. So basically, getting that evidence from the bank has increased our belief in the probability of a fall, significant fall in house prices from 70% to 80%. Okay. Let's do another example. Um, so we have a manager here who's um, come to believe that um, uh, on average, the people for whom she's responsible uh, are doing a lot of um, extra work at home, um, unpaid extra work uh, between um, four hours and 45 minutes and five hours and 15 minutes um, a week. So this is based on anecdotal evidence um, provided by some of the supervisors of these workers. So her prior probability uh, that this claim is true is 60%. Okay, so she has a 60% prior probability that the hypothesis is true. And then she, what she does is she commissions a, a kind of study. She gets 30 employees, randomly selected, of course, um, 
to keep diaries of the work after they leave the office at night. And um, after the results of this in, so these diaries get analysed, um, what she um, comes back with is that she's confident that the She's very confident that the average time spent working after hours by those employees is between uh, 4 hours 55 and 5 hours and 7 minutes per week. Okay, so this is a, you know, standard, take a sample, um, do some calculations, get a confidence, uh, confidence interval. Now, notwithstanding the limitations of the study, so, you know, some people might exaggerate and, and so on. Um, she makes a judgment that the probability of getting this this data, so the the end result, the actual evidence here really is the uh, the confidence interval there, um, to get it with knowing about how it was obtained. Okay, so the probability of getting this data, if in fact people are working um, uh, these extra hours, is ninety five percent. And the probability of getting the data if her hypothesis is false is only 5%. Okay, now in this case the two do add up to um, 100. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves there is, well the first thing actually is we just want to be write down the, um, the prior probability. So the prior probability is um, 60%. Okay, and we can uh, quickly calculate that, um, turn that into odds. So O1 is 60 over 40, which is, I'll just write it as 3 over 2. Okay, so that's the prior odds. <clears throat> the likelihood ratio is, um, is going to be 95%, so that's probability of getting the evidence of the hypothesis is true and the probability of getting the evidence if the hypothesis is false she says 5% so that's 95 over 5 which equals uh, 19 okay so now to get the posterior odds we just multiply so it's um, 3 over 2 times 19, which equals over. twenty-eight point five. So that's a pretty decent likelihood ratio. So nineteen is that's so that's the that's the likelihood ratio. And that's the posterior odds. So the odds have gone from um, three over two, okay, one and a half, to twenty-eight point five. So this evidence is having a really big effect. And what we can then do is we can convert that back to um, probability. So P two is going to be equal to O2 over 1 plus O2, which is going to be equal to 28.5 over 29.5, which, uh, what is that? That should be about 97%. the uh, that's the calculation um, I've got a, a practice example here I'm not going to do this one 
Now, what I would like you to do is do this one um, before the tutorial tomorrow. So I'm going to, I'll show you the answer in the tutorials uh, tomorrow, but it really would be useful for you if you um, can do this, try, have a go at this by yourself. Okay, so this this is a case that, um, as I'll explain to you in the tutorial, this is this is based on real data, um, but this is a case where you can use Bayesian updating, and it's a case where we we actually have some objective data about the um, the prior probability and um, and the likelihood ratio. So think about this one carefully. Um, try to go at doing the calculation and then we'll go through it in the tutorial tomorrow. And then what I'll do in the tutorial is I'll show you how we can use Bayesian updating to um, aggregate several pieces of evidence um, at once. And um, the example I'm going to use is, uh, uh, it's in a chapter from a textbook on evidence-based management, which I've I put on Wattle. So have a look at that. You don't you don't have to study the whole chapter if you don't want to, but the chapter starts off with a little case study, and it it, it works through the um, the case study um, piece by piece. Um, what I'm going to show you tomorrow is a kind of a you know a shortcut way of um, of doing it. But you've already we've already covered everything really that you need to know um, to be able to do that, and that will. I think give you some idea of how um, powerful this method uh, can be, um, and it may be of, it, it's it's something that could be of quite a bit of use to you in the critically appraised topic, because what um, I'm expecting is that you'll all come up with some, you know, hopefully in the end not large number, but a reasonable number of what you think is the best um, evidence, and. Uh, you know, you can if you want. Actually, you don't have to, but it might be a good idea to try and use this Bayesian aggregating technique to come up with a, a kind of conclusion about the strength of the evidence.